we're going to continue with our series on uh, the 2020 pandemic through God's eyes. Last week, we talked about the biblical view of sickness. Today, I want to talk to you about the biblical view of fear. That's because it's in our hearts. Now, let me share some interesting facts with you about the 2020 uh, pandemic so far. Some ironic, others tragic. For example, until four weeks ago, very few people used the expression social distancing. And you would have to give the context to clarify the meaning of what you mean. Also, in any other circumstance, people using the term shelter in place would not get away with a redundancy. Now, another fact here, according to the to an article in the Washington Post last week, the coronavirus killed its first democracy. And the author is referring to the amount of power granted to the prime minister in the country of Hungary because of uh, the pandemic. Another fact here, pro-choice people are furious because some states in the U.S. deemed abortion non-essential procedures. And also, by the way, so-called gender reassignment surgeries will have to wait because they're not essential due to the pandemic. Another fact here, Franklin Graham, son of uh, Billy Graham, the CEO of Samaritan Spurs, um, his events were banned from the U.K. not too long ago because of his uh, biblical view of marriage. But now he's been welcomed in New York and even in Italy uh, with his ministry, Samaritan's Purse, to bring hospital tents. And here's a troubling one. In the last couple of weeks, we have been confronted with the frailty of human life. And perhaps the most uh, painful truth about this uh, time is that the pandemic reminded us that we're not in charge of our own lives. It took a virus to expose us to the reality that we do not have the control that we think we have over our own lives. And that creates fear. In fact, I was heartbroken yesterday to read about a man in Illinois who uh, had to kill himself because of no hope, because of fear of having the coronavirus. And his autopsy showed later on that he did not have the virus. But thankfully, God has a lot to say about our human response to stress that we call fear. The expression fear not appears four times in the New American Standard Bible. The equivalent do not fear occurs 46 times and its twin uh, do not be afraid appears 58 times. And some of these are addressed from people to people, usually in the context of divine intervention. But almost every book of the Bible gives us the divine perspective on fear. Which tells us this book is more relevant than today's newspaper. Of course, we want to read the news. We want to be informed of what's going on around the world. But we find nourishment for our souls here in the Word of God. And today I invite you to open the Word of God, to survey Scripture with me, to see what God has to say about the unpleasant emotion that we call fear. Specifically today, we're going to look at the cause, the complexity, the confine, and the cease of fear. So let's start with the cause of fear, according to Scripture. Once again, I want to take you to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, where we learn about the fall of man, what we call the original sin. After disobeying God, Adam thought that he could hide from his Creator. And by the way, how do you hide from someone who is everywhere at the same time and knows everything? Here's what happened. After he ate, Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Genesis 3, verses 9 to 10 says this, Then the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So let's, let's clarify a few things before we move forward, because these are profound truths, so stay with me here. The all-knowing God does not need information on the whereabouts of Adam. The reason he is asking, where are you, is to give Adam a chance to confess, to call him to accountability. Secondly, God, who was everywhere at the same time with his whole being, that's the attribute of omnipresence, does not limit his presence to the Garden of Eden. The reason why Adam heard God in the garden is because creator and creature had perfect fellowship until sin entered the world. And finally, Adam's nakedness. Once pure and innocent became a source of shame, guilt, and fear 
Because perhaps at that moment, he knew that humanity, which was in his loins and seed form, would be infected by sin. And the reason we know that is because God had commanded him to multiply the whole world. The problem is that when men decided to venture outside of God's ideal for human flourishing, he became alienated from his creator and sin brought fear into the human experience. And that is terrifying. Adam was frightened at the presence of God because now the fellowship was broken. And uh, therefore, the very presence of a holy God caused terror and horror in the heart of this unholy human being now. And we see that pattern throughout Scripture. For example, Jacob, the patriarch, was surprised uh, that he was still alive after his wrestling match with God. In Genesis 32, verse 30, we read that um, he said this, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was preserved. And to Moses, God said in Exodus 33, verse 20, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. And church, the reason for that is because every human being, Christian or not, religious or not, is morally accountable to the Creator. In our hearts, we know that we fall short of His standard of holiness. And that causes fear in our hearts. The problem is that many people deal with this uncomfortable reality by suppressing the truth of his existence. Paul explained, explains this in Romans 1 verses 18 through 20. He says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, I call this suppression of truth the ostrich technique. And I'm referring to the large flightless bird that has a unique way of dealing with unpleasant situations. We all have seen the Discovery Channel. We all know this. Ostriches bury their heads in the sand, hoping that the problem will go away when they find this, themselves in a dangerous situation, which obviously doesn't happen. And that's how they become meals. Now, truth suppressors react similarly. Now, rather than to realize we have a problem, and that problem is we are alienated from our Creator, and that causes fear, Many people choose to bury their heads in foolish theories to make them feel better about themselves. And people, for that reason, think that they can avoid moral accountability, accountability to God if they just ignore His existence, despite all of the evidence. That's what Paul just talked about. They insist that human uh, uh, life is an ev evolutionary accident. And <laughs> there's a better way to deal with... Uh, our innate separation from God. Stay tuned. Other people like to avoid the reality of a broken fellowship with God and the fear that that causes by attempting to silence His Word. People like to silence the Word of God. And um, you can this way justify all kinds of behavior when you say, this book is not the Word of God. This book is written by men. Which is a very foolish way to try to suppress the truth because this is very easily refuted. For example, author Norman Geisler helps us with that. He says this, and he points out that every, even imperfect people are able to record perfect truth. Your mathematics textbook is a case in point. Now, algebra makes you smarter, but only the Bible nourishes your soul, makes you spiritually healthy because it reveals to you and to me that we have a spiritual problem and it leads us to the solution. And let me use biblical language since we're talking about the Bible to state the problem and the solution. Here's the problem. Because of what happened in Genesis 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul states this in Romans 3 verse 23. We can also say it like this according to Romans 5 verse 10. We were formerly alienated from God, enemies of God in our unsaved state. And that is a terrifying reality. The proper way to deal with this truth is not to use the ostrich technique and try to suppress the truth, but to listen to the good news, the solution to the problem, which Paul states this way, Romans 5 verse 8. God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're going to elaborate on that, so stay tuned. This is the cause of fear. We talked about that according to the Bible, but let me tell you about the complexity of fear. As an emotion, 
Fear has many dynamics. And by the way, fear is not exclusive to humans. Animals also experience that. But I'm talking about specifically the fear that we have about unknown circumstances. Now, I want to address two of the many dynamics of that emotion. Here's the first. If you've been reading the Bible for some time, you've noticed the expression fear God. Or the term God-fearing, referring to people. And those expressions confused me years ago when I started studying the Bible. Until I understood from Scripture that the term refers to a healthy devotion and respect. A hesitation to violate God's ideal for your life. I call that spiritually healthy fear. And let me show you the application of that concept by using some biblical characters here. For example, Abraham in Genesis 20 verse 10 had an encounter with a man by the name of Abimelech, the king of Gerar, the Bible says. And he, he felt necessary to tell him a lie concerning Sarah, his wife. And here's how he explains uh, this whole debacle to Abimelech. He says this, There is no fear of God in this place. Therefore, I thought necessary to lie. And here's what he meant the, uh, to, to, to that king. The people of that place suppressed the truth so much that they didn't even consider answering to God for kidnapping another man's wife. <laughs> and when people do not fear the consequences of their actions, church, that's when evil runs unrestrained. And we're in big trouble if people do not fear the consequence of their actions. Now, here's another man in the Old Testament. His name is Jonah. And he introduced himself to some sailors like this. And this is in the context of him running away from a clear command from God. He says this in Jonah 1 verse 9, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Now what he's doing here, he is uh, identifying himself as a follower of the true God, Jehovah, and he's saying he's a Jewish prophet, but he's also admitting that he made a mistake. So he says, I fear the Lord, meaning I fear the fact that I have violated God's plan for my life. Now, the psalmist uses the same concept in poetic language. In Psalm 66, verse 16, he says this, Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Again, this is a poetic way to identify the people of God. We are known for being God-fearing people, not necessarily because we are terrified of praying to God or to address Him as Father, but because we fear violating His plan for our lives and violating His principles. Luke gives us an example of such a man. In Acts 10, verse 22, he talks about Cornelius. And he says that he was a righteous and God-fearing and well-spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews. Now, when we go to the first epistle of Peter, he gives us an interesting uh, command here. He uh, instructs us to have this type of fear. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 17. He says this, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during um, your stay on the earth. And he uses the word phobos, the Greek word phobos, from which we get the English term phobia to address this. And the interesting and shocking part of this command here, church, is that he is addressing people who are terrified of persecution. The believers in Asia Minor who are facing persecution from Nero. And he says, you need to fear God. In other words, it says, don't fear the persecution that's coming to you. Have courage and understand that that is from God. But at the same time, you have to Love God so intensely that you must fear violating His word by ungodly conduct. And um, we need to do the same. We don't fear the situation, but we need to fear violating God's ideal for godly living by ungodly conduct, especially during times of crisis. For example, we, we do not hoard food. That would be violating the principle of generosity. We don't uh, despair. That would be violating the principle of trusting God in all circumstances. And we don't think about ourselves first because that would be violating the principle of selflessness, of Christ's likeness who thought of others first. So that's the point right here. We do not fear the consequences or, 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 or we don't fear the cir circumstances, I should say. But we fear violating God's principles during this time. This is a time to cling to the Word of God and to not have this unhealthy fear that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But before I do that, let me give you a modern um, perspective on this fear that is healthy. It's a healthy devotion. I love my wife. I'm not terrified by her, but I do fear breaking her heart. 
and violating my marriage vows. And that fear keeps me from looking at other women, uh, other women and makes me want to be a godly husband. Also along the same lines, I love my church. I'm not afraid of the flock, but I am terrified at the prospect of breaking your trust. And I pray that God will always keep that fear in my heart because I am painfully aware that the day I let my guard down is the day that I start trusting my own strength and my own flesh. And that is terrifying. That is disastrous. Now, too many godly men have fallen into sin and made shipwreck of their faith, to use another biblical expression. Now, That's the same reason, church, that professional fighters always keep their guard up when they are fighting. Because the moment they let their guard down, that's when they will take the knockout punch. And they keep their guard up because they fear letting down their coaches, their sponsors, their teams, and their fans. See, healthy fear keeps you healthy and protects you. Now, and this is the reason you have heard me say this many times before, never Never underestimate your ability to commit the most horrendous sin. Now, this aspect of the human emotion we call fear drives us, therefore, to our knees because we seek divine enablement. Now, here's another example of healthy fear, the one that we're doing right now. We've been avoiding large gatherings during this time because we fear infecting someone who has a compromised uh, immune system. We are enlisting, therefore, that fear for for the good of others. We are using that fear to promote sacrificial love, and that's good and noble. That's healthy fear. But let me tell you about the other dynamic of this emotion that we call fear. There's an unhealthy aspect of that, and that is paralyzing dread of circumstances out of our control because that reveals a lack of trust in God. We usually call this panic. That's what drives people to buy tons and tons of toilet paper and to hoard things that they may not need now and that's the one that the lord addresses in all the fear knots of scripture he wants us to trust him and again let me use some biblical characters here to show you a pattern let's see if you can identify the pattern here again let me use jacob the patriarch god gave him a command before he went to egypt and this is the command and he affirmed the patriarch by doing this i am god so he prefaces the command by saying who he is i am god the god of your father do not be afraid to go down to egypt now church the reason for that is because centuries later god wanted to rescue the descendants of jacob uh, from egypt and take him to the promised land he had a clear purpose and he told jacob do not fear going to that land to a man by the name of gideon God was very specific, and he said this in Judges 6, verse 23, Peace to you. So he prefaces by saying, Shalom, peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. That's a specific encouragement for a specific person here. But listen to this, through Isaiah, God comforted the entire nation of Israel, and he says this in Isaiah 41, verse 10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Surely I will uh, do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will hope, uphold you with my righteous right hand. And uh, in verse 13, he repeats, do not fear. I will help you. You see the pattern here, church? God wants us to not fear. Whatever the circumstances, he's got a plan for us, and that plan will be accomplished no matter what. We are not to fear. Well, perhaps that plan involves some hardship, but um, and, and we are painfully aware of the fact that God does not promise to keep any of us alive during the 2020 pandemic. But here's what Christ said to his disciples. And we as disciples of Christ have this blessed assurance in Matthew 28, 20. That's how he finishes the gospel here. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, although God does not promise necessarily to keep us healthy during a pandemic, Christ already promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age, church. And that is coming from the one who conquered death. And he promises to be with you in the stress, in the difficult situation. Therefore, there is nothing to fear. And that's why we like to quote Psalm 23, verse 4. And I encourage you to do it with me because most of you know it by heart. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And speaking about the good shepherd, here's something else. He said... 
in Matthew 10, verse 28, and he's addressing his disciples, and we take this to our hearts as well. He says, do not fear those who killed the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In church, what a profound statement here from our Lord. The coronavirus may kill the body. And by the way, we're entering the deadliest week here in the U.S. according to all the predictions here. It will kill bodies. But the coronavirus can never touch your soul. And according to Jesus, we're not to be afraid of it. But love God so intensely that we fear dishonoring Him. See, that's our attitude. That's what God expects from us. See, no matter how lethal COVID-19 is, God is the one who determines your eternal destiny, no matter what happens to your body. The good news, is, my friend, is that if you are a follower of Christ, God has already determined your eternal destiny. Because of faith in Christ, because of His grace, He secured that place for you in heaven where no virus can reach. So the pattern is obvious. God wants you to trust Him, even when you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We just need God's direction day by day, and we are living this reality now. What a great opportunity to live the reality that we need God's guidance day by day. We're living a day at a time, and that is wonderful to trust and depend on God and to know that He's got this under control. No matter what happens to me, whether I lose a job or my health, God is in control. See, and not being afraid doesn't mean we're careless. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to follow all the rules uh, of social distancing. And it doesn't mean we're not supposed to look for another job if uh, we lost our jobs during this time. In fact, let me say this. Consider this. You have a unique opportunity. Those of you who lost your jobs this week, you have an, a unique opportunity to trust Him in a way that you've never experienced before. As you look for another job, as you pray for him to, uh, to, him to uh, sustain you during this time, you will experience, my friend, the uh, providence of God like never before. Just get to your knees and articulate your uh, dependence on him. That is healthy fear. That's how you apply healthy fear. So we can summarize the complexity of fear like this. There are two dynamics that we're talking about today. There are more, but... The two that we're focusing on today is that Scripture instructs us to fear God, which we call a healthy devotion, a healthy love for Him, an intense love for Him that we fear violating His principles. At the same time, the Bible commands us to not fear the unknown because nothing is unknown to Him. You see? And therefore, we do not panic. We will not be shaken or be moved because our house is built on the rock that is Jesus Christ. That's another biblical expression. Our house is not built on sand, but on the rock that is Jesus Christ. So we talked about the cause and the complexity of fear according to the Bible. But let's talk about the confine of fear. And let me give you some good news. Just like he did with the reality of sickness, God has placed a restriction on fear. This means that the unpleasant emotion that uh, we experience from time to time here on this earth is confined to a specific realm. There's a place that fear cannot reach. Just like there's a place that sickness cannot go to, fear cannot penetrate heaven. And one man was fortunate enough to preview that place. I'm talking about John, the revelator. He tells us the story about a divine summons. To heaven when he was in his 90s exile in uh, the island of Patmos he heard from the Lord come up here in Revelation 4 verse 1 come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things and the up there that the Bible is talking about church is the control room of the physical and spiritual universe where the throne of God is and John saw that glorious throne, and he also saw 24 elders sitting around that throne on smaller thrones. And these guys are representatives of the resurrected church saints. And the, what we notice in that scene is not one of them is afraid of the dazzling glory of God. Why? Because they have been resurrected. They are now in the presence of the glorious Redeemer. Now, prior to this scene here, there was an event that we know as the Transfiguration. Christ unveiled his divinity to three of his disciples. And even though Peter, one of the guys who was in Jesus, uh, with Jesus uh, on that day, recognized the glory of the moment and even suggested to Christ that let's build some tabernacles here for us, Lord, because this is good. He recognized the glory of the moment. But the moment that they heard the voice of God, all three men fell down in terror. 
Why? Because they were still in their mortal bodies. And by the way, that story is in Matthew 17, verses 2 through 7. They were still in their mortal bodies. And they were still on the earth. But the scene in heaven in Revelation 4 shows us very clearly that fear is gone. In heaven, uh, uh, the fear of God... Uh, the, terrify, the terror of the presence of God doesn't exist because people there have been redeemed, resurrected, and glorified. And the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ accomplishes that. So these scenes here, church, in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, uh, describe to us the, the spatial confine of fear. In heaven, every human emotion springs from everlasting joy. There is no fear. There is no anxiety. And let me let Jesus encourage you. Jesus himself encourages us by saying this. Here's what he told his disciples in Matthew, rather in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Church, once again, what a remarkable statement uh, by Jesus Christ here. He has been preparing a place for us for the last 2,000 years. And fear does not exist in that place. And how do we know that? Because Revelation 21 verse 5 says, I am making all things new. And the new creation knows nothing but true happiness, eternal joy. No place for fear because there is no sickness there either. And once again... I want to remind you of your position in Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, in fact, Christ himself says that you are blessed beyond your imagination. In Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, remember that we studied them a few weeks ago. You are happy, truly happy according to God's standards, truly blessed. And let me focus here. Let's focus on the future aspect of those Beatitudes. Let me, again, list them for you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven and you will be comforted you will inherit the new earth where you will rule with christ your hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied and you will receive the full benefits of divine mercy you will see god face to face no reason to hide no reason to fear him and you will be called his children forever In church, I cannot think of a better way to counter fear than to survey these promises and realize that the unpleasant emotion that we call fear is confined to our present existence. It's part of our experience now, but one day that will be no more. And I want you to consider this too. Believers in Christ who died from COVID-19 during the 2020 pandemic are more alive now than they've ever been. Because they are now uh, safely in the arms of God, they have been promoted to glory. And although we mourn their loss here, we rejoice that they are now safe forever in the arms of their Savior. And to experience fear never again. Which leads me to the next point. We talked about the cause, the complexity, and the confine of fear according to the Bible. And finally, let's talk about the cease of fear. As an emotional response to danger or stress, fear not only has a spatial limit, it has an expiration date. One day, God will get rid of it entirely. Here's how. The current heaven and earth will pass away, according to Jesus in Matthew 5, 18, which means that everything uh, will be made new. We've already looked at that. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when that day will be, but it reveals how that day is going to take place. Through the pen of John, the... Uh, disciple who wrote the book of Revelation. And here's what he said in Revelation 20 verse 11. He reports, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And here's the replacement in Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4. He says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. 
In church, that is how God is going to reverse the curse that started in Genesis 3. And that's how he's going to get rid of any fear or any unpleasant emotion. From that point on, there's only, there's only a, a joy, everlasting joy. In fact, the day we die from this body, if you're a believer in Christ, the day your body ceases to function, you are immediately ushered into the presence of God through Jesus Christ, never to experience fear again. That's a promise from the Word of God to you. That's the cease of fear. Now imagine the resurrected Adam, along with the rest of the redeemed, looking at God face to face uh, without fear. There will be no need to hide from the Creator because the Creator have already made a way for that to happen and restored the fellowship. The Creator is also the Redeemer who paid the price for every one of our sins and He rose from the dead to grant eternal life to whoever believes in Him. And that is, my friends, the end of fear, the cease of fear. The Bible has a lot more to say about the emotion we call fear. But today we just focused on the cause, the complexity, the confine, and the cease of fear. But let's spend the next few moments now talking about the conclusion about fear. I started this message by listing troubling facts about the 2020 pandemic. But let me close by listing some features of the eternal home of the believer. And I hope that that will encourage you and, and look at the situation from a divine perspective. Remember, your eternal home, my friend, if you're a believer in Christ, is a place where fear does not reach, sickness cannot get to. First fact is this. In this earth, we may experience shortage of supplies, shortage of food or whatever, but in the new earth... The redeemed will have unrestricted access to the water of life. This is what God promised in Revelation 21 verse 6. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. You see, if you thirst now, if you experience um, any lack of anything now, know this, that in your future home, where you're going to spend eternity, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will lack nothing. God has already provided a way for you. Now, second fact here about the eternal state. In the new earth, the redeemed will have unrestricted access to the tree of life, and which produces leaves, according to Revelation 22, verse 2, for the healing of the nations. Now, resurrected people don't need healing because they have already experienced glorification. So the tree and its fruits are for our enjoyment. In fact, the uh, word that the Bible uses is for therapy, meaning uh, for our enjoyment. Not because we need healing or restoration for anything. But can you picture the redeemed victims of COVID-19 gathering one day next to that tree in the feast to honor the one who was pierced through for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities, and by whose scourging we are healed. And third and last point here, or fact about the eternal state. The main feature of the capital city, New Jerusalem. It says this in uh, Revelations, uh, Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp, is the lamp, its, its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the uh, honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean. And no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, church, the pandemic has reached every city in the world, practically. But the New Jerusalem will never be infected. Because that's the place that Christ is preparing. And don't you know, anything that Christ prepares is perfect. Nothing that He prepares is less than perfect and ideal. And if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, my friend, your name is in that city census that we call the Lamb's Book of Life. And your name will never be erased if you are a believer in Christ. But the problem is, if you are not a, a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, I urge you to consider His kindness towards you today. He desires that everyone be saved, and that's in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, and to come to the knowledge of truth. And we have just verified here that truth is not a concept. 
According to the Bible, my friend, truth is a person. And that person says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. That's in John 14, verse 6. And that truth, personified in Jesus Christ, invites you, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's in Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, he invites you. So we echo the invitation today, friends and family. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, today is the day to come to him because he invites you. And he says, I will give you rest. Do you want to find rest for your soul? Are you terrified uh, uh, of this pandemic? Are you terrified of where you're going to spend eternity if you die from the virus or, or f f for some reason something happens to you and you find yourself in eternity now having to face your creator? Then come to Jesus Christ. He'll give you rest for your soul because he promises he will make you a new person. You will have a totally different reality uh, and, and, and he's going to transform fear in hope. You will have the hope and the peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't mean you will never experience fear again. I experience fear from time to time. But we know where to place those fears, do we not? Church, we place them at the foot of the cross. And we present them to Christ. And we say, Lord, I am afraid, but I am trusting in you. So please replace that fear in my heart with hope and peace. And my friend, if you do not know Jesus Christ, you are yet to experience that reality in your life. And I want to urge you, therefore, to come to Christ today. Because he invites you to come to him. Him. Do not ignore his call to you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the realities that we find in the word of God, Lord, about how to deal with fear, Lord. And to think that a book so old is so relevant for our lives because it talks about um, your plan for us, Lord. It talks about your perspective on our lives, your perspective on this pandemic, and your perspective on fear, just like we looked last week on your perspective on sickness, Lord. We are blessed because we can look at your, your perspective on fear. And because you instruct us in the Word of God, fear not, Lord. We want to ask you to equip us to experience just that, Lord, to fear not, Lord. We, we don't want to fear the circumstances that are outside of our control, Lord, if there's anything we need to do uh, to uh, change the situation, for example, practice social distance, yes, we will do that, or, or look for another job, or, or to check on our family and friends, yes, we, we need to do that, Lord, but ultimately, we need to trust you, because that's how your word instructs us, to fear not, but to trust you, Lord, and we want to take our relationship with you to the next level during this time, Lord, and maybe that's the reason why the world is sick now, because you want our attention, Lord, and it's time for us to uh, turn to you, to fix our eyes on you, Lord. So this morning, I want to pray for the entire world, Lord, for people who don't know Jesus Christ, Lord, that today is the day for them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, soften their hearts, we pray, Lord, for the message of the gospel, Lord. Break the heart of, of, of stone and give them a heart of flesh, Lord, a heart that is open to the gospel, Lord, a heart that will turn to Jesus Christ, a heart that will repent of sins and turn uh, to the sanctification that is available in Jesus Christ for newness of life. Lord, it is our great joy and privilege here at Grace Baptist Church in little Salem, Oregon, in our corner of the world, Lord, to be proclaiming the truth of the Word of God, Father. And this is not the time for us to be silent. Quite the contrary, Lord. It's the time for us to proclaim even louder uh, the, the so great a salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, Lord. And we consider this a great honor and privilege. Lord, we thank you for the flock here at Grace Baptist Church. Every one of my brothers and sisters with whom I talked this week and the last week, Lord, they're inspiring me because of their faith in you, Lord, because they're, they're standing firm. Lord, yes, we are apprehensive. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But, Lord, we are trusting in you, Lord. We don't need to know what's going to happen tomorrow. All we need to know is that you are already there, Lord. And, in fact, we would be terrified if we knew the, the, the future. We don't need to know the future. All we need to know about the future has been already revealed for us in the book of Revelation, for example, Lord. And we take great delight in studying your word, Lord, because it nourishes our soul. So thank you, Father, for that reality, Lord. And, yes, we do uh, bow our knees to you, Lord, and we cry out to you for cure, Lord, find for you to equip the scientists around the world to find a vaccine or a cure for this lord um, because we want you to be honored and glorified lord and this week since uh, all the predictions are telling us will be the deadliest for our nation father we mourn the loss of people 
who will go into eternity without Christ, Lord. Thousands of people perishing on a daily basis, Lord, and many of them are going into eternity without Jesus Christ and are therefore separated forever from you, Lord. Father, break our hearts for these people, Lord, and break our hearts in such a way so that we will communicate the truth of the gospel to the people who are alive now so that when their day comes, they will find themselves in the right side of eternity in heaven where fear cannot penetrate, when sickness will be no more, when tears will be no more, and sorrow gone, Lord. And uh, we pray, Father, that this will never be... Uh, those truths will never depart from our lips. Lord, as long as we are on this earth, Father, as long as there is breath in our lungs, Father, we will proclaim the love of Christ, the kindness of God and Jesus Christ in drawing people to himself and calling people to himself, Father. And if there's anyone listening to this message, Lord, today or watching this video who is yet to come to Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that now, Father, you will break those hearts and uh, they will come to a faith, uh, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ today, Lord, for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.